and welcome back for this next session. Our next speaker is uh, Ahmet Erdem. It's just easy. It should be easy to pronounce, but why do I struggle? Easy. Ahmet. Yeah, thank you. He's a lead data scientist at Trendyal with a background in computer engineering and artificial intelligence. Besides data science, he has prior experience in robotics and software engineering. He's a Kaggle grandmaster and enjoys solving all kinds of machine learning problems, but his primary focus is deep learning and unstructured tabular data. He also maintains several open source projects. So we're excited to hear from Eridal Ahmed. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So this session is about uh, feature importance, but in e-commerce setting, in an e-commerce uh, project. Uh, so uh, Walter already introduced me, but I can also mention a little bit. Uh, if you are on Kaggle or GitHub, or if you have watched Bojack Horseman, probably you know this picture. So this is my favorite character, uh, Todd Chavez. And here he is doing some data analysis, and he's deciding that uh, Halloween store in January is a great idea because there is some correlation between Halloween stores and suicide. So, yeah. And, yeah, you know my Kaggle profile, and I am currently lead data scientist at Trendyol. Uh, probably you don't know what Trendyol is. Uh, it is an e-commerce platform that, like, you can do... Uh, you can search for the product you want to buy, and uh, then you can see all the options. You can compare their prices, uh, you can see uh, their review, and you can buy them, and once you buy them, you can put a review, uh, or before buying, you can read uh, all the reviews and decide. And Trendyol actually has like three sub-companies. Yeah, one is uh, this app, actually. The other is Dolap. Dolap is like second hand version of uh, Trendyol. And, and there's Trendyol Express, so uh, and this one is for uh, delivery. So once you buy something from Trendyol, most likely that it's, it is delivered by uh, Trendyol Express. So I have recently joined this company, uh, and we have a lot of domains inside. Uh, so like homepage, Require actually stands for recommendations. So we, we have a lot of uh, recommendation system problems, and then uh, we have uh, search. I am mainly working on search, search relevancy. Actually, it is like uh, yesterday's uh, competition uh, topic. So what I am working on uh, on a daily basis is very similar to the yesterday's competition. It was a surprise for me. And we have, of course, NLP computer vision tasks, uh, because uh, one thing uh, really fun about e-commerce is the da data is very diverse. Like, uh, you have images of the products, you have all the descriptions, all the reviews, uh, you have also tabular data, uh, like price of it, and you have also a lot of time series forecasting, like how, how much I am going to sell, or like what will be the, is there going to be a stock out or not? So it, it, there, there is a the, uh, variety of uh, problems. And if you are interested in such problems, uh, Trendyol is uh, becoming global. We are already, in, uh, I think, available in uh, several European countries. And we are hiring in Berlin. Uh, if you are uh, considering it, uh, you can just email me, ahmed.erdem at uh, trendyol.com. So uh, how did I meet Trendyol? It was uh, with a Kegel competition. So they organized a local Kegel competition. Uh, before that, I, I knew about the company, but I didn't know if they were using data, if they were doing anything fancy. So they organized a local competition, and the task was uh, if a user will return a product. So like you have usually 14 days, and if you don't like a product, you can just return it, or sometimes it can be defective or other reasons, uh, then you can return it. And the competition aims to predict, uh, like, once you buy it, are you going to return it? And we, we had data about the product itself, users' demographics, uh, questions and answers about the product, reviews about the product, supplier information, 
and, and the most important uh, transactions, like uh, which products user uh, bought before. Um, and it is a binary classification problem, and they chose F1 as a metric. So uh, validation scheme is o the most important thing. Whenever I start a Kaggle competition or any problem, I start with setting the validation properly. Uh, in the morning, John France also mentioned a lot. Uh, this is like a time split problem. Uh, they provided uh, the last week as a test set. Therefore, I wanted to replicate uh, the test set case. So usually for also in your daily jobs, what you always want to do to try to replicate the uh, production, right? Uh, if there is going to a gap, for uh, how long uh, are you going to predict? Uh, these are things you should consider. But in Kaggle competitions, one thing, if uh, especially on the community competitions, you have access to the test set. So you can use the test set, uh, but yeah, at the end, uh, it is not really useful for production. Uh, anyway, when you make uh, feature engineering, you need to make sure that you don't leak anything. So one thing I can advise, you can always, uh, after you split the data, you can set validation sets uh, target to nulls, or you can just drop the column. Then you make sure you never use this information. Then you can do whatever you want. Then you can concatenate, concatenate the data and do any kind of feature engineering. Uh, after you are done with feature engineering, you can just join back uh, all the validation targets. Uh, then after you iterate, uh, you, you generate your best model, then at the very end, you can train with all the available data before you submit. So uh, there was some seasonal trend also. For some reason, uh, user tend to return a little bit more in some uh, days and a little bit less in some days. It is probably due to some uh, discounts or some campaigns, let's say. Uh, so in order to avoid uh, such problems, I think one should do time sliding window uh, validation uh, scheme, like, like in, uh, in the morning session. Uh, but here, it was a short competition. I wanted to iterate fast. And therefore, I went for just single validation set, and it was large enough. And one other thing to note, F1 is not as sensitive as log loss when it comes to such uh, changes in uh, target distribution. Uh, so it was like a, to faster uh, experimentation, uh, I could go with one validation set. As a model, I use XGBoost on GPU. I started with light GVM on CPU, and XGBoost on GPU was two times faster. And I had no uh, categorical features. Uh, it was th the main reason I was avoiding using XGBoost. But in this problem, all features were numerical. And then I could just switch to XGBoost and get the same performance in uh, two times faster time. Uh, again, uh, in the morning, Philip mentioned they also don't use early stopping. I only use early stopping to estimate where it could end in the very beginning. Then I stop using early stopping because then it gives optimistic estimation of validation score. Learning rate is, yeah, usually you keep it as small as possible with the trade-off of time. Uh, and the other parameters are not very important here. Maybe I can mention my favorite uh, par parameter, mean child weight. Like I, I really like this one. It is like how much data you allow at the end of the leaf. So if when it is very low, then it can really uh, it is easier to overfit. And instead of tracking the competition metric itself, which is F1, I just tracked uh, area under the precision recall curve. Because F1 is just for one threshold, but this is like uh, between thresholds, so this is more robust. Uh, I decided based on this metric until the end of competition. So as a result, there were a lot of uh, shakeups in the leaderboard. Of course, it was a local competition, not a global one, so it was not that competitive. But at the end, what helped me was a uh, was the I think good validation scheme. I didn't shake while other people were shaking up or down, and 
and I decided my uh, submission based on my validation score. They split the public and private by days, like public was the first two days, and private was uh, five days uh, after it. Uh, so it, it was dangerous to decide based on public score. I decided based on the validation subset, uh, because the test set had, uh, they said they are not going to score all the items in the test set. But yeah, again, I didn't uh, diverge much from my uh, best submission. So, okay, we have a model that is uh, working great. Uh, what are we going to do with this? Uh, they also wanted to get some insights. So it is a competition plus uh, some, uh, let's say, presentation competition. At the end, they also wanted to get insights about the features we use. Uh, here, I use low for feature importance. I will deep dive into the features uh, like as much as I can, but as, uh, as an example, you can see that user return mean is the most important feature. If a, if a user has tendency to return the items, it will uh, likely to return uh, this item too. It, it is very straightforward. And LOFO provides uh, importance means and standard deviations. I think you will understand better how it does in the next slide. So you can just uh, pip install LOFO importance. It is open source. Uh, but what LOFO does, uh, I will just read uh, as it is. Uh, LOFO importance uh, calculates the importance of a set of features based on a metric of choice for a model of choice by iteratively removing each feature from the set and evaluating the performance of the model with a validation scheme of choice based on the chosen metric. So. As you see, I emphasize some of the things like validation scheme uh, and model of choice, evaluation criteria. So let's, let's see uh, what are the advantages of using Glofo. Because there are a lot of feature importance methods. You can check XGBoost on feature importance. You can use Sharp, anything. Uh, so there must be a reason to use Glofo. It is model agnostic. So if you are using linear regression, but you have a feature with a uh, nonlinear relation with the target, then that feature is not really important for you if you are going to use linear regression at the end. Uh, so it, it importance actually depends on the model. And uh, with LOFO, you can feed any model that has fit predict scikit-learn API. And it is metric dependent. Uh, remember uh, yesterday's uh, metric, it was map at um, for each query, uh, we were calculating it. But you, most of you translated the problem to binary classification, right? In that translation, you could also give, uh, for example, queries target encoding as a feature. For binary classification, it is very important. But for map, for each query, it is not important. So a feature importance should be metric dependent. And the other thing is, um, it doesn't gr favor granular features. Uh, it generalizes well. Why? How, how does it do it? Uh, because uh, if you look at uh, trees, let's say if you feed ID, like uh, let's say in the previous one, product ID or other kind of very granular features, model will exploit it. Model will use it as much as it can. But the question is, is it really useful if you look at your cross-validation? If, if you are doing, let's say, product by split, if your model is going to be applied on new products, then even if model uses product ID a lot, it is not useful and even probably harmful. And if it is harmful, LOFO assigns them negative uh, importance score so that you know that you should remove this feature, especially if its importance is larger than its standard deviation. And standard deviation, by the way, comes from the cross-validation, since you have uh, different splits, you can also calculate the standard deviations of the importance. Uh, other feature uh, LOFO has, uh, it, it can group the features. So you can uh, provide group of features like your TF-IDF features. Like you, you can provide each TF-IDF token as one feature. But normally, there are like hundreds of them or thousands of them. You don't want to do it. And, and they mean something together, like they are generated from the same text. 
So you can provide them together, Lofo adds them or removes them at the same time, or save for uh, one hot encoding features. And it can also automatically group features for you. If you have correlated features, for example, let's say you have A and B, both are very correlated. If you remove A, B can, model can extract the same information from B, then, model, then Lofo could think that A is not important. Likewise, if you remove B, then model could use A. Uh, so then both could look like they are not important. But you, you set a threshold and Lofo can uh, automatically group them, then Lofo could add and remove A and B together, then it uh, solves the correlation problem. So this leave one feature out uh, technique is not my in invention. I just encapsulated it, it, made it a package, and I added such, uh, such extra things like grouping, etc. So uh, it is a, here is a sample code. For this problem, uh, while I was always validating on one validation scheme, when I was running Lofo, I did on I did like threefold, and since it is time split, I decided on uh, three times, uh, like sliding windows, and I split the data by it. Uh, Lofo could accept any train indices, validation indices pair, or you can also provide scikit-learn k-fold, group k-fold uh, kind of um, functions, uh, yeah, the out or output of functions, and and model you define your model uh, it it may not be the it may not be exactly the same as the model that i described most of the parameters are the same but i went for smaller number of estimators because it will train and evaluate train and evaluate so i i could go for faster experimentation i just reduce its size sometimes you may also need to subsample the data because it's a bit cost the process even if it is parallelized or you can use here I could use GPU XGBoost without any issue, uh, but if it is not parallelized uh, model, Lofo parallelized it for you. For each feature, it runs it on different thread, and then uh, you have your features here. You have your uh, data frame. You set the target here. We don't have any extra feature groups, and I set auto group threshold to 0 0.8. Then I create my Lofo data set. Then Lofo automatically groups some of the features, like discounted price and original price are very correlated, like they are above 80% correlation. Of course, I have another feature, which is discount rate. Uh, it is not correlated with them because it's the rate, but price themselves are very correlated. Like other features are also correlated with each other. Um, then they are grouped together and it is also uh, making Lofo faster because instead of removing one feature, you remove two of them or five of them at the same time. Uh, here, uh, for Lofo importance object, you provide your cross-validation scheme, you provide your model, and you provide a scoring function. F1 is defined by scikit-learn, so you can just write F1. Or if you had something different, you could just customize it uh, without an issue. Then you say Lofo.getImportance. So I used the output of Lofo and I figured that these are very important features. There are nine features on the right and there are also somewhat important features, but uh, they were interesting features for me. I wanted to inspect and Lofo told me that remove age, age is not important. It, 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 it only overfits. Uh, then I also included age. Then I took these 12 features and fed them into a model again and then I calculate their sharp. Why do I still need sharp? Uh, because Lofo only tells me they are important or not. Lofo doesn't tell the relation, like if higher is contributing more the target or lower is co contributing more. In order to understand how these features are contributing to the target itself, then I use sharp. So for importance, I trust Lofo, but when it comes to explaining how it works in the model, I, need, I still need sharp. And here, we have a uh, user return mean. It is very obvious, I think, like if you return a lot, then it is likely that you will return again. And discount is a bit interesting uh, because it doesn't have 
very correlated relation with uh, target, but when uh, there is discount, it is more likely that customers return it because I guess the, the, the reason is, we didn't really discuss this, this one actually much with, uh, with the team, but I guess uh, customers just see it and don't, dis uh, don't think much because they don't want to miss the discount and they know that they can return. So it, uh, it I think, accelerates their decision process to see discount and discounted products are returned more. And other things, for example, price. If, if it is something small, let's say if it is only one euro or two euros, uh, you don't bother returning, right? But if you bought something uh, two th for 2,000 euros, then of course, uh, if, if you didn't like it, uh, you want to return. So price is also very important and very has very linear relation. So here, linear relations are easy to uh, see, but for the nonlinear ones, we had to inspect more how they uh, interact. For example, ship costs, if, if they pay a lot for the shipment, they don't return it like, because yeah, shipment cost is not returned, only the product uh, price is returned for them. So ship cost is also important. Um, membership age, like the more experienced, more experienced members, they return more, uh, maybe they trust the product, uh, the, uh, they trust trend, all that, they can get their money back. Uh, this could be a reason. And similarly, return previous order, it, it is also, it has small effect because it is like a little proxy to user return mean. Uh, but if they return previous one, it is also a little bit likely that they will return again. And other thing is like that there were other features. Lofo said, age is not important, don't use it. And we here on SHAP also, we don't really see any clear relation. And then, so it, it shows that user return behavior doesn't depend on age at all. So if we make models, we should remove age and so that model, mo model could overfit on age and we don't want to do this. So age has no effect. Gender had very small effect. It is very small, but it seems uh, males are less likely to return. I don't know the reason, but it is a small difference also. Uh, variance bots uh, is an interesting one. Uh, we figured out with this model, uh, people tend to buy uh, same product with medium size and large size and try them, then if medium fits, then they return large. So if they buy the same product with different uh, variants, it is very likely that they will return a, at this uh, rest of the products. So these insights, and we had more, but they were not really obvious. Uh, they could help us uh, understand uh, users' behavior on the product return. I think that's it, so if you have questions, I can take them. Hello, thank you for the presentation. So you have the question regarding your uh, cross-validation scheme, or actually your train test uh, validation scheme. Um, and I guess it's a question I could ask uh, uh, Jean-Francois earlier also. Um, uh, my question is, uh, um, don't you have an issue of not using the recent train data? Uh, because uh, I, I guess it's a kaggle, but uh, in, a, in a real uh, business use case, um, what would you do to, uh, at the same time, have a proper validation scheme, but also use the latest uh, uh, trends there could have been? Yeah, so here you make all of your experimentations with this train validations a bit, but when before going to production, you train your data I with the same parameters, everything keeping everything same with the whole data. So you can use the most recent data, but for experimentation, you don't use all of the data for training. Uh, okay, thank you. And you don't think there is a like, risk to using more data, for, for example, than in the training, for example, especially with gradient boosting? Um, is there like uh, uh, some parameters to change? Uh, do we have the guarantee that the performance will stay the same? 
of course, there are risks because if you retrain and you don't test it right. For such thing, you can do a lot of monitoring. Like you can s check if distribution is the same between uh, the new week. Like uh, on Kaggle, adversarial validation is very popular. Like you can uh, you can try to distinguish if your previous training set and the new week are are similar, at least from the same distribution. If there are such issues. Uh, you can detect early with your monitoring system. So, of course, you will need something to monitor because if you retrain with the whole data, by logic, like I don't expect much uh, issue, uh, but still, yeah, still I cannot 100% guarantee. So, you need some uh, monitoring, model monitoring in place. Okay, thank you very much. Let's take one more question. Anyone? Oh, we have over here. Thanks, Ahmed, for this nice presentation. My question is, uh, did you implement that in real life in your company right now? Sorry, I, I couldn't understand. Sorry, can uh, you? Was the work that you did uh, implemented in real life in your company? Is it in production right now? So I joined uh, them two months ago. Uh, okay. So currently it is in the implementation phase. So it is not implemented yet. And they also wanted to use it as like to get some business insights. Like uh, therefore I also did this feature important study. So because like even if uh, you know the return rate after user bought the product, maybe you cannot do much because uh, this uh, at least this uh, setting was calculating the probability after they buy it. But uh, we, we could also train another model that we don't use the information at uh, time t where it buys the uh, product, then maybe it could be used as something more preventive. But this one is a bit difficult to use in production. But yeah, we are working on it. And actually, we do have one more question. So this. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you if, so you talked about feature importance, but do you have any way or method that you also create features? Because this is, I, I would say it's also an important part, so can you share some tips on how you do that? Yeah, so actually I showed the basic features in the model, but the, the gap was mostly from the engineered features in my case, and that were mostly target encoding features, like I created a lot of combinations, like user category, or like, uh, I, don't, I don't know now, but like they, you, I had a lot of uh, features that I could either use at category or I could just pin them. Then I created target encoding features, but one needs to be careful about target encoding, especially it is like a time split problem. So you have to make sure that you only get the target encoding until you add items to the cart. So you don't, uh, you shouldn't get any information from the cart itself or after. It was challenging, so therefore I created a custom code. I couldn't directly use uh, classic group by uh, target means, uh, but uh, this. Uh, Target encodings, especially on the combination of features, were very useful. I think they made the gap uh, with other people. All right, let's uh, thank Ahmed for a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.